It reminds me that like, it's not easy to overcome any of these obstacles that we all face in life. And I think as long as we're trying, and I think we all, there's all, always something we can be better at and kind of work to redefine within ourselves. And so in the PT world for me and my business, it's helping people kind of redefine their injuries and overcome that. Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. Thank you to Tracksmith for their support of For the Long Run podcast. Tracksmith is a Boston-based running apparel brand born from a desire to celebrate both the history and the evolving culture of running. I have been loving their Van Cortlandt long sleeve, which pairs well with the Alston half tights on a brisk fall day. Imagine a world where running injuries don't exist and every runner stays healthy. That's the world I want to live in, and that's exactly the world that Recover Athletics wants to make happen. Recover is the first prehab app for runners. It instantly generates custom prehab programs made up of strength, plyometric, and mobility exercises to help loosen tight muscles, get stronger, and run your best. Their team designed it with top physicians and marathoners like MEP. It's guaranteed to make you a stronger and more injury-proof runner. If you want to fix your aches and pains, get stronger and set PRs, go to the App Store right now and download the Recover Athletics app today. Welcome back. I have Jimmy Picard joining me from Salt Lake City, Utah. Jimmy, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate your time. Of course. So the first question is always a a tough one, uh, and we'll dive right into it. Uh, Who is Jimmy? Yeah, that's a great question. I tried to prepare a little bit for this one because I know you always ask that. So I think first and foremost right now, I'm a husband and a father. Got a new one-year-old little baby boy at home uh, and then another boy on the way. So husband, father, number one, number two, a PT and coach, uh, and then a runner. Very cool. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about all of that, but let's sort of set the stage with you as as Jimmy the runner uh, or the running aspect of, of your life. Uh, do you remember your first run? You know, it's a good question. I don't remember my first run, but I remember ever since I was, let's say, elementary school, I knew I wanted to be a runner and I have no idea where that thought came from. But I remember in elementary school, like wanting to race kids on the playground. And then I just could not wait for middle school because I had a track team that I can join. And so, yeah, ever since I was a kid, it's just been something that's been there that I've wanted to do. What was it about the track team? Yeah, I think it was just being able to like be around a group of runners and then to kind of compete, I guess, even back then I liked the idea of competing. Like I said, racing kids on the playground, it was just like a fun thing to do, um, and a way to test yourself. Yeah. And so where did that lead to for your running? Yeah. So it was like in middle school, I kind of dabbled with everything with track, um, never did cross country. Interestingly, I played football as a little tiny scrawny kid. I just, again, loved competing, but it track was definitely where my heart was. Um, and back then it was like, I did everything. I did long jump. I did triple jump. I sometimes shot put, I did it all of it. And as I moved to high school, continued to play football for a couple of years until it was pretty apparent that that wasn't really going anywhere. I loved it, but just didn't have the skill set. Just a small guy, right? I think I was maxed out in high school at like 150. Uh, so it was not going to be a stud football player. Um, so Get junior, knocked around all the time. Yeah, exactly. And it was fun. Again, I loved it. I, I, I've always loved lifting weights. So I think I liked that part of football more than anything. But junior junior year, I decided to commit 100% to running, gave up football, joined the cross-country team, continued on with the track team. And then, uh, yeah, I just committed 100% back then. And 
took me, uh, like, I'm so thankful that I did that because, uh, I come from a family, uh, a single mom house where no one in my family went to college and I had very little understanding of what it meant to like get into college. I had no guidance or help with that process. And I was fortunate enough that I ran decently fast in high school and was able to have one coach look at me at Hampton University in in Virginia. And that kind of opened the door for college for me. I ran at Hampton for one year. Um, Hampton University is a historically black college in uh, in Virginia. So I was one of uh, maybe like two or three other white kids at the school. So that was very interesting time. Like I loved my time there, but their distance program wasn't very good. And so that first year of college, I started looking for other places to go uh, that focused more on distance And during that time, I also ran like in high school, my mile, I was an 800 runner. My time was 156 back then. My mile time in high school was like 455. So pretty bad. (laughs) (laughs) But that first year at Hampton, I dropped my mile. Yeah. I just didn't like long distance back then. I loved to run, but I didn't want to run more than two laps on the track. Uh, But at Hampton, I fell in love with, I really fell in love with running and trained like a madman. I remember reading all the books, like the Prefontaine book and running with the Buffaloes and tried to mimic their training. But I got my mile time down to a 416 and ran, I think 15, 15 in the 5k indoors on. And so like ran faster that first year and was able to transfer to a better program, ended up going to William and Mary and yeah, just ran that, ran there all four years, loved it, had a math, like a big team. We had 40 distance guys and just amazing to have four years with 40 other guys that you're spending every day with running and pushing yourself. Um, so yeah, running did that for me. It got me into college. It got me, uh, the opportunity to get a degree at a really good school. And then from there I graduated and I was kind of, um, a little bit delusional and thought I could be a professional runner. So got a job at a running shoe store and just trained like crazy after college, continued to set PRs on the track and then started getting to road racing and all that. And then uh, I kind of left out a big part of the path this time. Uh, in college, I was probably injured 50% of my career. So I was just always banging into these injuries. I'd get, I just, we ran really hard in college. Our easy days were prescribed at six minute pace. So we went out and kind of hammered each other every single day. And as a result, I was injured a lot after college, kind of kept that same mentality of just running hard all the time and no surprise, got the same results, injured a lot. And eventually stepped away from running because of getting injured so much. And it was around that same time. That's when I started PT school because of being injured, basically. Like, it's kind of like the cliche story you hear it all the time. It's like the injured athlete becomes a PT because he wants to figure out how to treat injuries. Um, But that's, that's my path. And uh, during PT school, took up bike racing because I couldn't run because I was injured from running, fell in love with bike racing, did that for three years until I basically until I got healthy and then started running again. And yeah, so any questions there? Sorry, I feel like that was a long winded answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate the background here. Um, what was it like getting back into running after all of the time off and, and how long did you take off? Yeah, that's a good question. So first, I guess... I took off three years, um, basically all of PT school. And first it was like giving up running or starting cycling and letting go of running was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I kind of felt lost without running and I needed that break though, to step away from it, kind of to realize that I was not going to be a, a professional athlete. I needed to like realize that and I needed to step away from it to be okay with that. And then cycling was awesome for me because it gave me something to fill the space. And then when I started running again, it was really, really nice because I was able to come at it from a less competitive side and kind of see running as just something that I love to do. And 
something that I love to do with other people and the community of runners. So coming back to running, yeah, just kind of took away that ego a little bit, the ego side of running. And let me just really enjoy running again. Talk to me more about the feeling of when you were not running. You said you felt lost without it initially. It sounds like it wasn't by choice that you stopped running. Yeah. So again, like just being injured all the time and the the injury that kind of set made me start riding bikes was a, a big calf strain. Um, so it wasn't even this, a, a very serious injury, right? I just strained my calf, but it was pretty, it was bad enough where I, it was like months of trying to rehab it with no relief, right? I, I keep trying to come back from running and it would immediately flare back up. Um, and so it sounds silly because I was not a professional runner, but it running was so much a part of my life that I, I, I felt like if I stepped away, I was losing the community of people that I'd been around at that time in my early twenties, I was living at a house with four other runners and that's kind of what we did. You know, we were just runners. We had the runner house. Um, we didn't party a lot. We didn't drink a lot. We just ran together. And so to leave that was really difficult. But again, I think at that time I had to do it because I was beginning to develop like an unhealthy relationship with running. And, uh, I think anytime you start to identify too strongly with something, I think it, it can become unhealthy. And that's kind of where I was. I heard somebody recently say, like, I think this, the saying is you can fall in love with an idea or a thing, but you shouldn't marry it except for your spouse. And so I had like tried to marry running and then put, gave it too much a priority and just wasn't healthy. It's a fascinating place to be or a fascinating um, perspective. I did a podcast with Megan Roche on, we spoke a lot about identity, identity as a runner, identity as a X, Y, Z. Um, and at the time she was running pretty well. And right now she's not running at all. And she can't for three to six months at least uh, due to some heart issues. And I always wonder like, for an athlete like that or an athlete like you or someone who's like so in it, do you, do you get to that realization because uh, you're forced to get to that realization or have you sort of gotten there before being forced to it? And, and I guess the, I don't know. Cause it's like so many people evaluate their identity as a runner when they're injured. So is it, is it by necessity that we have these internal discoveries or, or, or not? What do you think about that? Yeah. So I think for me, it was like always something I thought about just because when you're a runner on a D1 team, your life is running. Right. And so right. you quickly realize like you're not normal, right? You're not going to the frat parties. You're not doing the normal, you're not living the normal college life. I was remember maybe you do, and then you don't run well. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's a trade off, right? I remember before I started school, I have an uncle who went to uh, Radford University, which is like a notorious party school in Virginia. And so, again, no one in my immediate family went to college. So, I, my understanding of college came from his experience, was this as a big party thing. Then I get there and it's like, I'm the dorky runner, like just wanting to run all the time. And so I think I always questioned it because I always knew that this wasn't quite normal, right? If that makes sense. Um, I think for me, it's, so I also come from a, I have a, a father who was an alcoholic. And so I've seen like the addiction firsthand through that. I have a brother that was also an alcoholic and ended up passing away at a very young age because of it, uh, alcohol and drugs. And so I've I saw this negative side of addiction and I saw that same thing in me with running. And so I never, I, I think we justify it a lot saying like, oh, this is a healthy addiction to have running, but I think it can become unhealthy. And for me, I saw it becoming unhealthy. It was just taking over my life. It's all I cared about. And it's funny because I was never one of these runners that's like all into the stats behind running and the professionals and like on let's run every single day, but I was obsessed with running myself. Um, so 
now I can't even remember what your question was. Sorry. Well, no, it's, it's fascinating. And I think, I think you can be super all in on running and not be obsessed with it. Like I have a friend, his name is Brogan Graham. He started November project or he co-founded November project. And he gives me, he gives me a hard time. He's like, you just fucking love running so much. I'm like, yeah, I do. Like what I do for work. I talk to runners all day. I host a podcast about running, but it's, it's less of the, and I run a lot. And now, now I live in Boulder, like, like be more of a stereotype. Um, but what's been, what's been fascinating is three years ago, like if I were to get an injury, that was like, that was it everything else sucked. Yep. And I've been able to get to a place where like my own running isn't a defining part of the identity. The story around my running, I find some piece of the identity there. Like it's, I think it's why I, I host this podcast because I'm so fascinated by like the, the mental aspect of it and the psychology of like, how do you do what you do and improve, right? I've had, I don't know, 175 professional elite athletes on this podcast and they all are different humans, but they all have some characteristics that make them similar in that they've been able to achieve X, Y, Z. I don't know where I was going with this, but I guess the idea is that like many of us have these periods where we are obsessed with running and it's the end of the world if we can't run. And then we can potentially graduate to a point where we absolutely love running, but if we miss a day, whatever, it's, a, it's not the end of the day. I was listening to a podcast with Rich Roll this morning. He had Joe DeSena on, who's the founder of Spartan Race. Mm -hmm. Really wacky dude, um, but really, really fascinating individual. And to give context for those who don't know Joe, um, he has made it so that his kids understand the value of hard work. Uh, he was telling a story which will sort of set the the expectation here of his one of his kids right before Christmas when he was four. And the kid wasn't the best prior to Christmas and was, you know, not listening and this and that. So there were no there were no gifts for him under the Christmas tree. But there was a note that said, your gifts are at the top of the mountain. <laughs> Santa Santa had, couldn't get them all down for you because you weren't listening, blah, blah, blah. So That's the kid hilarious. had to go up to the top of the mountain. So he's intense. Like his kids have all run marathons before they were 10 years old. He's got four of them. And Joe and, and Rich were talking about rigidity and like the idea of sometimes you, you actually need to back off in order to stay consistent or in order to like keep moving forward. And it was fascinating to hear someone like Joe talk about or agree with what Rich was saying in this regard. And so I think that's the, that's the part that's really hard to get to. And the example that they give was like, yeah, if you've got to take your kid to practice, like, and so you miss a run, you miss a run. Like, are you going to pick a run over your kid's practice or, a meeting at work or this and that. I don't know how we get to that place, but when we're able to get to a place where we truly love the sport and we're able to miss runs, or if we get injured, it's not catastrophic mentally, it might be catastrophic physically. Um, and we'll get to that. Uh, but I, I think that's where, right? Like the, the secret to success physically is consistency. And if you don't beat yourself up when you miss a teeny little piece in the puzzle, but instead are focused on putting all these bricks together to build the house. Like that's where you win. Yeah. Do you think that's just becoming more mature? I ask that question all the time. And, um, usually the answer is yes. And my opinion on that is yes too. Like, I don't think that I could have had that belief when I was 24, 25, 26. And, you know, what took time off due to injury, like, I was just frustrated. Um, I'm still frustrated when I get injured, but come, come to it from a different perspective. Like my longest injury was going into 2020. The first six weeks, I didn't run for like towards the end of January for six weeks. And the place I got to it, I had a bilateral stress reaction in my tibia. So that was fun. Uh -huh. um, and the place I got to it with my coach was, well, we found the limit. 
And then we found a little further than the limit. And this is a data point and we will adjust and stop running in uh, carbon plated shoes all the time. <laughs> and so like these were the takeaways from what three years prior would have, you know, blown my whole world upside down. Yeah. And I imagine like the whole time and beforehand you get an injury and there's a lot of catastrophizing worst case scenario. You're telling yourself all the bad things are going to happen. And then you kind of realize the more you get injured that like, Hey, like it's really not that bad. And I'm able to get back right. to running pretty quickly to the level I want to pretty quickly. Didn't ruin my season most of the time. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, but I think it's really hard to get there and you have to go through that process in order to grow mentally in order to like be able to handle it. Like, I don't know, last week I ran three days instead of six and it was what it was. Like I didn't, I'm supposed to be in pretty hardy base training for 50 K in March. And I'm like not stressed that I missed three days of running. And instead of forcing it, I did what I needed to do. Yeah. So it's just like kind of like growing up and realizing that, hey, it's not that big of a deal. This is just something I love to do. It doesn't have to rule my life and I don't have to beat myself up right. if life got in the way. Thank you again to Tracksmith for their support of the podcast. I've been a fan of Tracksmith and their community first efforts ever since my early days of running in Boston. As my miles increase again ahead of some big goals this coming spring, I'm definitely doing it in comfort and style with their gear. I'm also proud to partner with Tracksmith because they're going to donate 5% of your order value to the Michael J. Fox Foundation for all orders, and you'll also get free shipping. The Michael J. Fox Foundation is dedicated to finding a cure and helping those living with Parkinson's. Both of my grandfathers have or had Parkinson's, and I'm grateful of Tracksmith's support for something so personal. Visit tracksmith.com slash for the long run to see some of my favorite pieces, and all orders that start from that page will contribute towards this donation. Recover Athletics is a supporter of not only this podcast, but also my own running. It was built in Boston by two lifelong training partners who got tired of aches and pains getting in the way of their training. In 90 seconds, their app will customize a program for your body and your training. I plugged in some of my more common aches and pains, and I got a custom-built program designed to strengthen the muscles and tendons that will help avoid these issues going forward. Your first custom pre-app program is free, and they have an unlimited free trial. You can get it on the App Store right now by searching Recover Athletics or click the link in the show notes. If you like it and want to upgrade, their premium, premium subscription costs less than one trip to a PT. Give Recover a try today. Your legs will thank you. So what are some of the most surprising things, right? Because... I have an interesting relationship with a handful of different um, body workers or chiropractors or um, physical therapists. And my chiropractor, Brian Kent in Boston, particularly plays like the role of therapist. I also have a therapist, nice. um, but we also, we often like go deep on life, like in that treatment space. Um, so talk to me about some of the, some of the surprising things that, that you've heard over the years from, from injured runners. Yeah. Um, first of all, I listened to that podcast with you and what is it, Brian or Brad? Brian. Brian. Yeah. The great podcast. I really liked it. Enjoyed what he had to say. Uh, I thought it was a great conversation between you two. Um, I, I'm curious your thoughts on the, on his, uh, was it, um, what was the injury that he, he called out in that plantar fasciitis? He's like, I don't, I don't believe it exists. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, I feel like one plantar fasciitis one is just like, yeah, it's kind of, it's, I think he made the point. I believe he made this point, but it's something that, that I think is very true in our, in the world of injury and rehab is like, we have all these terms like, uh, like patellofemoral pain syndrome or, greater trochanteric pain syndrome and it's just, or plantar fasciitis. And it's just like a fancy way of saying a certain area of your body hurts. That's all it means. Right. And it's kind of like plantar fasciitis is kind of like a garbage term that just means the bottom of your foot hurts. Right. So it's not necessarily anything specific. I think that's kind of the point he was making. It's like, there are all these more specific diagnoses 
or diagnoses that it could be. Right. So yeah, I, I would, I'm on, I'm in agreement there. And I think, uh, there is, there is a plantar fasciitis where the actual attachment gets irritated and inflamed. Uh, but it's probably not every single person you see with, with foot pain. Right. Um, but then back to your question about like, yeah, things, crazy things that people are, were you asking like the interesting stories patients come with? Yeah. So yeah, interest like what I think is kind of sad is that a lot of the interesting stories that patients come to me with are stories that they are given by other therapists or clinicians um, trying to help them, right? So I recently was or even worse, other runners or other, yeah, exactly. Because you know, it's it's funny. That's kind of how it works. We get injured. And we immediately start looking for an explanation or a story that we can tell ourselves. And we go to our friends, our, run, our running buddies. Uh, we go to Google. We go to various clinicians, doctors, PTs, chiropractors. And we kind of all, we get a, a host of different stories that we start telling ourselves. And so it's not necessarily the ones that we create ourselves. That I, Those can be interesting, but often it's like, some of the things that PTs and chiropractors and and I've been guilty of it too that we tell patients is pretty bizarre. I've been I was working with a patient uh, last week, and this patient had within the past year seen ten different clinicians, mostly PTs, but some chiropractors thrown in there too. And the things that she had been told it was insane. Like she's got knee pain and. First of all, it's on the inside of her knee and one person tells her it's her IT band, which never seen somebody get IT band pain on the inside of their knee. And then another car or not a chiropractor, another PT is telling her that it's her cranial nerves that are causing her knee pain. And so it's like, it just makes no sense. But because somebody in a position of authority told her that now it's something that's floating around in her head. So then what? So, so then what with this specific patient, it's like trying to kind of challenge these stories that we've been told and give her a little bit, a a more realistic story. So I like to try to keep things as simple as possible. Uh, in most people, most, if you're injured, you really just want some reassurance that it's going to be okay, that things are going to get better. Uh, maybe a rough timeline of what that would look like and then something to do to fill that time, right? And I think clinicians are so desperate to help people that we try to give stories, one, to, to show that we're smart and we know what we're doing, right? So we create some sort of story to uh, appease the patient and make them think we know what we're talking about, right? And so... For me, I I like to just focus on the reassurance. Like if I can rule out anything big, bad, and serious, make sure there is no sinister injury, then it's just reassuring the patient and just stressing that and giving them some exercises, make them a stronger runner, uh, maybe tweak some running form, tweak some running cadence, things like that, and then go from there. Very cool. What's your favorite part about being a PT? So for me, it's, it's that it's like talking to people. So I think when I first got into the profession, I wanted to be the person to fix you, right? If you got injured, I wanted you to have, be able to come to me and I was going to fix you. I was going to do some stuff to you, whether it was uh, joint manipulation or some sort of active release therapy or some hands-on technique to fix you. And so that puts me, that, that's kind of how I started my PT career was thinking that was going to be the way to get people out of pain. And I quickly realized that those things are okay, but they don't really fix the problem. They're a very small part of it. They can help the patient feel better, but it's much more about like figuring out what, yeah, what are these stories the patients are telling themselves? How can we make sure it's an accurate story And then if it's not change that story. And so that's all just through conversation. What do you mean by stories that people are telling themselves? Yeah. So, um, so I'll give the example of myself. Like this summer I was doing something stupid and injured my hip. And immediately the story I started telling myself was like, I just tore my labrum, right? 
I am going to have to have surgery. I'm so young. If I have hip surgery, I'm probably going to have to have a hip replacement fairly young. Like, and my brain just starts going down this rabbit hole, right? Like Catastrophizing. Spiraling. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we all have a tendency to do that some more so than others. Uh, and I think it depends on how much you value the thing that's going to be taken away if you're hurt. Right. So for me, I value running a ton. And so I'm, I get really anxious and catastrophize when I can't, when I have an injury. And so it's those stories that I'm, that I care about. So like if I were to have been able to have a rational conversation with myself, it would be, I would tell myself, all right, let's do an assessment. Let's look at your hip, make sure there isn't any serious pathology there, show you why, or show myself why that's the case, uh, kind of confront that story and try to change that story. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Talk to me where you'd go with an athlete suffering chronic injuries and maybe drawing on your, your own experience or, or not. Um, someone who just like can't catch a break pun not intended this time. Yeah. Those are hard, hard patients. And it's hard because oftentimes those people are, they're desperate to get back to it or they're desperate to, to do the thing they can't do. Um, and so working with someone like that, it would be trying to figure out one, why it's so important. Is there other areas in their life that they're trying to like fill in the gap with that? Right. But then two, it's, it's also trying to figure out ways that they can do that thing that they want to do, but maybe at a reduced uh, volume. Right. And you see this a lot with like aging runners as we get older, especially if you ran competitively when you were younger and you're now in your forties and coming up with like getting little niggles kind of all the time. Right. And those people, I'm, I'm kind of one of them where it's like, there's always, you know, there's always something coming up and it's getting them to kind of accept that that's going to be the way it is. You're going to have little things come up here and there and not getting too worked up when they do kind of like you were talking about earlier, it's maturing and realizing like, Hey, I can like train a little bit less, maybe three times a week instead of six times a week for a little bit. And it's not really the end of the world. And then maybe even figuring out a way to like add some other activities into their life to substitute for the thing they can't do. That makes sense. Um, so you mentioned that you might identify with this group a little bit as, as you go, um, as the years go, as the years go on, it wasn't a very elegant way to put that, but how, <laughs> as how we get do older, you your, yeah, as you get older, as we age, like a fine wine. Yeah. Um, how do you set your, uh, your goals these days? Uh, so personally, yeah. Yeah. So I'm still training hard. Like I, but I've had to realize like one, I have a, a one-year-old son right now. And so that's been a huge adjustment. And you kind of alluded to this earlier where it's like becoming a parent kind of forces you to look at your, your training differently. Right. And so for me, I love training, but I love my son more. And at the same time, I want to show him that I can have a healthy relationship with running and I want him to love it too. Um, and so for me, it's, it's like I li living in you in Salt Lake city winter time is awesome because there are so many options to do outdoor activities. So for me, being outside is a huge thing. And so on my schedule now, it's on uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm on baby duty in the morning. I have to get him off to daycare. And so if I don't have patience in the morning, I'm going to take him out and go do like an easy ski tour with him. Or if it's nice out, I'm going to push him in the stroller and then drop him off at daycare. Like I'll run to daycare with him. And before... I can remember like seeing in my twenties, seeing dads pushing their kids in the strollers. I'm like, that looks terrible. Why would I ever do that? How am I going to get a real run in if I'm doing that? And now it's just like accepting that, the, you know, this is where I am in life. And I get a lot of joy out of pushing him in the stroller and running with him. You know, I get a lot of joy in going for a hike with him. And so for me, like I talked about in college where like my easy runs were done at six minute pace, right. Which is just stupid. And 
it's really nice to now like kind of embrace the easy days as like, Hey, I can go push my son on the easy run and that's training. And that's a good day. You know, I don't have to be killing it every single day. Um, so currently like I'll do that. I mix in some cross training with ski touring, with some cycling, and then definitely I try to get into hard running workouts a week, long run in every week. I strength train twice a week. I'm pretty fortunate in that my work, I work in a gym. And so if I have, if I'm slow, I can just go get my workout in. I also, I coach, I, um, coach runners remotely, but then also in person do some strength coaching. And so that's been a lot of fun to be able to like hop in with the strength group that I'm working with. The strength, the strength training pieces is always of interest to me. It's the one thing that I keep saying, I'm going to start doing it. Uh, you and so I, should. And I never do. Yeah, I know. And now I have the space to like, I can buy the equipment and then like, I have no excuse. Like it's in my house. Yep. Um, and I just need to bite the bullet and purchase some stuff uh, to remove all excuses. But um, for a runner who's interested in getting into strength training, a la myself, where would you, where would you begin? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah. So new, like I'm, I'm thinking of someone like you who's been running and training consistently, uh, that wants to add strength training. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who wants to be more durable and, and stronger at the end of races and, you know, avoid the const, constant hip flexor issues and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, for sure. So first, I also think like just in general, as we get older, it's important to add some strength training for bone health and things like that. Uh, it gives us a different hormonal response when we strength train versus when we uh, just go out for our long runs. So I think if you're trying to start, get started into it, strength training, I think it's important to to think about what the goal of strength training is. The goal would be to actually build strength because you're building muscular endurance and endurance when you go run. And when you do your interval workouts or your hill workouts, you're building endurance, you're building muscular endurance there. So when you're in the weight room, strength training, the goal there is to build strength. So I think it's getting less popular, but like back when I was in college, when we went to the weight room, it was low weight, high reps. So we would knock out, like have like the empty bar and do like three sets of 20 back squats or something like that. And that's just building endurance or muscular endurance. Um, and you're, again, you're already doing that with running. So if you're going to start with strength training as a runner, it's important to like differentiate those two. And then I think first thing would be get comfortable with lifts before you start trying to get heavy. So I think uh, Dan John is like a famous strength coach here in uh, Salt Lake. And he's kind of famous for saying that all, all humans need to do is push, pull, squat, hinge, and carry. Right. So those are the things I like to focus on. So a new, new person to lifting, it's learn how to squat, learn how to deadlift, learn how to do a push up or a pull up and get comfortable with those movements. And then once you're comfortable, you're not getting sore from doing like three sets of 10 at a moderate weight. Once that's comfortable, then you're moving on to trying to lift fairly heavy, but lower reps. So I really like uh, this model where it's called the DAPRI, but essentially what you're doing is 10 reps, really easy, eight reps, moderate, six reps, as hard as you can, and then one more round of six reps. So basically you're doing 12 reps that are hard. The rest are pretty easy. And then you move on. And so I think that would be kind of the, the broad framework is get comfortable first, then start lifting heavy. Then you can start doing things like a single leg split squat or a single leg deadlift um, where it's more running specific. But I think it's important to build that kind of like base foundation with bilateral movements before you move on to single leg. Cool. That makes sense. It's fascinating to see the like action reaction of this stuff. Like I've started using an app called recover athletics and it's, um, they're sponsored the podcast, which <laughs> helps keep me consistent with it. Like I nice. kind of need to be using it if, if I'm promoting them. Um, but what I, what I find fascinating is like when you do the work that is intended to help you stay healthy or feel better, you do that. Like they, they have a routine that's 
the basically you plug in um, the injury that you most consistently have or the area that you want to strengthen with prehab movements. And it's intended to alleviate those issues. And I was having a ton of hip flexor issues in the fall and I did it consistently for a few weeks and the hip flexor issue went away and then I stopped doing it and then it came back. So it's, it's really, I got to stop climbing so much, but, um, or running hard downhill, but, um, yeah, it's fascinating when, when like, it's one of those things that there's so much evidence to say, like, if you do this, then this will work and we just don't do it or, or sure. we do it and then it gets better and then we stop doing it. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, so it's been interesting because I recently here at the gym started a class for, uh, like a group strength training class for uphill skiers. So like ski tours, schemo racers and runners. And it's been really fun to see these people with no background in strength training come in and just like fall in love with it. They love the way it makes them feel. They don't love at first when they're getting sore all the time, but once they get out of that phase, they love it. They're comfortable and they end up just, they become a better well-rounded athlete. And I think there is a trade-off. It's like, it's hard to fit it into most people's days. Like you said, if you can build a gym at your house, that's probably the best way. Um, I think the group classes, if you can find a good one to go to, they're good because there's a little more accountability there, right? People know that you, they're waiting for you to show up. Um, right. But yeah, there's there's definitely a trade-off, but I think there's there's enough evidence to support that at least for kind of marathon running and below, so distances below marathon, that you do get a significant improvement in running economy through strength training. And there's some evidence to suggest that strength training does reduce your risk of injury. It doesn't prevent injuries, but it can reduce your risk of getting injuries, especially like you're saying, if you know you have a problem area, strengthen that stuff. There's there's good evidence for that. Um, but yeah, it's just hard to fit in most people's busy schedules. Yeah. I got to a point where, uh, massage therapists and PTs have told me that my hip flexors are like a guitar band. They're that taut. It's like, mm, nice. that's a bad thing. <laughs> I need to fix <laughs> that. Um, what do you wish, what do you wish you knew when you started that, you know, now when I started running or when I started PT? Yes. Okay. Let's start with running. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 I wish I knew for running, I wish I had like the courage to run slower on my easy days. Like that's a big thing I've been thinking about lately is because looking back at, at my training, it was, it's insane to think that I did that. And like, again, easy days, six minute pace. And they, I had somebody prescribing that, a, a coach telling me to do that uh, and telling all of us to do that. And so I wish I could go back, tell myself, Hey, like let go of your ego go run by yourself if you have to, but take those easy days easy. That way you can show up fresh and ready to crush the hard days. And then for PT, you know, I think, again, I kind of told you the evolution of me as a therapist, where it's like thinking that all the hands-on stuff was the bread and butter, the way to get people better. And I don't know that, I want to say that I would tell myself that that's not as important, but I think I had to experience it firsthand to, to like really get the lesson of like, those things aren't the end all be all. So then maybe if I would tell myself one thing back then, it would be at the beginning of my PT career, it'd be listen more, right? You don't have, the patients have the answers. You just have to listen to them. Cool. I love that. Um, I think my last question is uh, if what you've shared today resonates with someone, where can they find you on uh, social media? Yeah. So I, basically only use Instagram and I, I'm terrible at social media. I'm really bad. I try to put out content, but so Instagram, I will respond to messages there. It's redefined physio. And then the, probably the best place is shoot me an email. Uh, it's Jimmy at redefined PT.com. Cool. Uh, talk to me about, I guess one more question. Yeah. Uh, where did redefined physio come from? Oh boy. Great question. So I, I mentioned earlier, I have a brother that passed away. So his his name was Kyle and he took his life when he was 17 years old. And 
we had, uh, during one of his, while he was in, uh, recovery at one point, him and I, and my mom all went out, got tattoos on our wrist. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, and so he had tried uh, that prior to this, he had attempted to slit his wrist. And so that's why we got these wrist tattoos and above his cut, he had redefined written on his wrist. So the, uh, for me, this Dude, was a like, reminder every day. Yeah. For him, it was a reminder. Uh, ultimately it wasn't enough. Uh, but that kind of, so that in, he inspired me basically. And I wanted to name this after him. What sort of, um, when you hear somebody else use those words, redefine, redefine physio, whatever it is, does that sort of elicit good, good vibes every time you hear it? It does. Yeah. Because I think for him, he, he was trying to redefine his life and it was something that he tried really hard to do and he couldn't. And so it reminds me that like, it's not easy to overcome any of these obstacles that we all face in life. And I think as long as we're trying, and I think we all, there's always something we can be better at and kind of work to redefine within ourselves. And so in the PT world for me and my business, it's helping people kind of redefine their injuries and overcome that. So yeah, anytime I hear it, I love it. It makes me happy. It makes me sad a little bit too, as you can tell. Um, But yeah, it's something, it's a word that will always be something special to me. And uh, in 20, in 2008, when I graduated college, I had, I rode my bike across the country and as my way of mourning the death of my brother. Uh, and on the bike I rode, I had them, uh, the company paint redefine across the top tube. So it's like, again, it's just a word that's been with me since 2006, I guess. Very cool. I think that that's a, it's a good way to go into 2022 to, to hear that and think about that. Um, now I have one more question if that's okay, but, For sure. um, how did you, how did you choose biking across the country as a way to, uh, honor and celebrate him? I, you know, it's kind of like, how did I choose How did I fall in love with running? I have no idea. I didn't know anyone that had done it to me. It was like, I think partially it was because you hear people running across the country, you hear all these people doing crazy things. And for me, it was a way to get people's attention and, I ended up doing it to raise money for teen suicide awareness. Um, and so it was a way for me to get attention, like get people's attention to say, Hey, like this is an issue. But then also it was like, like I said, it was a way for me to be alone for an extended period of time. Like I went by myself, this was pre GPS. So it was paper maps, me with a flip phone, you know, like, uh, just being alone with my thoughts, listening to music that he loved and seeing the the country. I'd never been west of uh, like uh, Tennessee at the time. Cool. I'm sure that's a, we could have a whole nother conversation on, on that journey. Um, and I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to, at some point I have, I'm, I'm so curious about that, but Um, I think that's a good place to wrap for today. Um, and thank you for sharing that part in particular, as well as the rest of, uh, what you've shared with, uh, with the audience today. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Of course. Likewise. See you out there. Yep. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next time on for the long run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too. This podcast and the accompanying music has been produced by Brian Walters of Single Track Sound. For the Long Run's logo was created by Vanessa Wolf of Sterling Wolf.